Welcome everybody to the fourth installment of OFE's Open Source Policy Series. My name is Sivan Petsch, I am OFE's Research Director and I have the pleasure to open tonight's event on a topic that the team and I spent a lot of time on over the past 12 months. For those who don't know us, Open From Europe is a Brussels-based think tank working at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. We've organized this event to give you more details about the European Commission study investigating the impact of open source. While the study is not out yet, we can provide new information today and you'll have the chance to ask questions later. I don't think with this audience it's necessary to give a long intro on something that we all know. Open source has become ubiquitous wherever software is a factor. Some estimates go as far as 90% of software having open source components. And with software eating the world, open source isn't far behind. In a moment, we'll hear directly from Pierre Chastanet, head of unit at the European Commission's Cloud and Software Unit, on why they have tendered the study. But before that, I would like to say that we at Open Forum Europe are very pleased that together with Fraunhofer ISI, we could do this work on understanding the impact of open source software and hardware. We see the study as a milestone of open source research and much needed, being the first comprehensive study in over 15 years. The study assesses the economic dynamics behind open source, its economic impact on the European economy, how open source has impacted important uh, pro uh, important economic sectors, the impact of policy actions around the world, and finally provides policy recommendations. We're thankful for the European Commission to have tendered the study, and the European Commission is already here, thereby increasing our collective understanding and, on, uh, and knowledge on open source. After Pierre Chastanet's keynote in a minute, our collaborator Knut Blind from Fraunhofer ISI and TU Berlin will provide you with an overview of the results regarding the economic impact and policy recommendations. Both will then join our panel, also featuring Jutta Kort, Head of Director DG2 at the German Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community, and Reagan McDonald, Director of Global Public Policy at Mozilla. This panel will be moderated by our excellent collaborator in the study, Andrew Katz, a lawyer leading in the area of open source and joint managing partner at Moore Crofts LLP. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. We want this policy series to be a pace, space for open exchange, and we are very happy to take questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question during the panel, please write your question in the chat or use the Ask Questions feature in Crowdcast. Please also take note that this event, like all OFE activities, is covered by the OFE Community Participation Guidelines, which you can read on our website. And a reminder, this event is being recorded. So. We had Pierre Chastanier on for a second now, uh, but he should be coming back, uh, I'm sure, um, so that he can start his keynotes. So we'll just wait for a second until he comes back. There we are, yes, perfect. Yes, it works, yeah, can you hear me properly? Yes, I think we can. Then I will minimize myself and uh, we're listening to you. Okay, very good. Many thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, ma many thanks to OFE and for the Fraunhofer Institute for the work on the study uh, that was commissioned by the European Commission on the economic impact of open source uh, in, the, in the European economy. We, we can see that uh, open source has really gone through a, a maturity uh, process. Uh, over the past 10 years, it has moved from uh, something that was done in, uh, in a garage uh, to something that is really um, uh, into uh, all digital uh, technologies uh, nowadays, and that is attracting uh, the uh, attention of large global, global companies, investors uh, across uh, the globe. So we can see that the, the market is well aware uh, of the potential and the added, huge added value uh, that open source can, uh, can have. So that was the, the reason we launched uh, this study on the economic impact of, uh, of open source software and open source hardware in the, in the European uh, economy. I will come back on the, the hardware uh, aspect in a, in a moment. The, the study has uh, been identifying already a number of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and challenges uh, of open source in relevant ICT policies, um, in cybersecurity, in artificial intelligence, in digitizing uh, the European industry, uh, but also in sectoral uh, aspects like uh, connected uh, mobility. So the, the study really looked very broadly, both at technologies and sectoral uh, application from this uh, economic point of view. 
Another of our objectives through this study was to uh, explore the competition uh, angle uh, of uh, open source. Uh, we know that open source drives innovation and helps lowering uh, the barriers of entry uh, for uh, new market players uh, by providing a software base on which like any startup, SME, uh, can start developing uh, its innovative ideas. So, Intuitively, open source helps to increase uh, competition and to bring more uh, dynamis, uh, more dynamism uh, into uh, the, the software uh, market uh, for the benefit of, uh, of consumer and, uh, and businesses. But what we, want, what we wanted to see is um, uh, try to quantify uh, this, uh, this benefit. So by removing barriers to uh, use uh, and develop software, uh, open source uh, would ensure a level playing field uh, where uh, the market winner can be those who add value to their product, to their services, uh, to their customers, and not those who lock uh, their customer with proprietary solutions. Um, so as I said, open source, uh, we believe, lowers barriers for new entrants, reducing the, the burden uh, to use what, they, uh, what has already been developed uh, by other uh, community, uh, but enables them to focus on really the key added value on uh, new innovative uh, features uh, that they can then bring successfully uh, to, to the market. Let me uh, quickly address the, the open source hardware uh, dimension, which was also a big novelty uh, in what we wanted to explore with, uh, with this study. Uh, obviously, the, the level of maturity of open source uh, hardware uh, is pretty far from uh, the one of uh, open source software. Uh, nevertheless, we see that the business ecosystem uh, developing in open source uh, hardware is, is moving very fast. Uh, 3D print for instance, is a, is a good example that comes to mind, where very quickly a global ecosystem uh, has, uh, has developed in, uh, in this area. Open source hardware shares a number of features uh, with uh, open source software. Software, uh, Its mod modularity, for instance, the capacity to self-assemble uh, different uh, features. Uh, and it appears to follow the same development as uh, open source uh, software. So we do expect that the demand for open source hardware is going to uh, grow very rapidly in the, in the coming decade. It could actually constitute uh, a cornerstone of the future uh, internet of things, uh, the future of computing uh, at European and global uh, level. Um, what is the, the role of the, of the Commission in, uh, in all this? Um, well, let me recall that the uh, European Commission is uh, agnostic uh, and must remain technology uh, neutral, so we don't favor any uh, specific uh, technologies. However, our role is to put in place uh, the right framework uh, conditions that will enable to increase uh, European economic growth and innovation uh, potential that will both bene benefit citizens and European uh, enterprises. So a very relevant outcome of the uh, study conducted by OFE and, uh, and Fraunhofer is the identification of open source with what economists call uh, the public good. Um, so that's a very different approach to uh, how open source was regarded, uh, say, a decade ago. Uh, now we can see open source as becoming uh, a common good, a common digital uh, good. Uh, this new conception implies positive correlation of open source with public wealth. Uh, and that's a, a reason per se for uh, public administration, notably the commission, to foster the use of, uh, of open source. What's more, we're seeing a, a positive correlation between uh, the increase in contribution to open source and economic uh, growth. So that's uh, one of the key outcome of the econ econometric work of the, of the study. Uh, qualitatively, it seems pretty logical that more contribution will generate more opportunities, more ideas will generate uh, more startups, more uh, SMEs. Uh, what is new now is that we have, in uh, through this um, economic econometric aspect in the in the in the study, the evidence that demonstrate and support uh, those uh, ideas. Um, let me 
um, highlight now the, the importance uh, of the skills uh, aspect around uh, open source. Uh, this is uh, yet another uh, societal uh, dimension which is very uh, important in uh, analyzing the, the development of digital market. Um, software quality and uh, productivity uh, increase uh, are highly impacted by the uh, acceleration of the use of open source software. Uh, enhancing the developer's knowledge on open source libraries, uh, on repositories, on middleware application uh, developed through open source can be a decisive skill uh, for developers to, uh, to develop uh, and put on, uh, on their CV. Uh, it's uh, notably uh, important for older professionals who want to uh, requalify, who want to upskill, uh, and we have been used in the past to use mainly proprietary software uh, to develop new competencies around uh, open source. So we see as building the necessary open source skills in Europe as a, an imperative for ensuring digital competitiveness of the EU. Let's have a look uh, at uh, open source and the next generation uh, internet. Uh, you will understand that um, uh, open source and uh, next generation internet have quite a common value in common, and that's why we are keen to foster uh, open source under the uh, NGI initiative. Building a European initiative for a human internet that respects the fundamental values of uh, privacy, security, participation, diversity, it's not an easy job, uh, but open source is really a, a very good tool to deploy our common European shared values in the next generation internet, in what Europe wants to project uh, in the um, uh, internet, including in global discussion. This will uh, notably enable uh, to support uh, uh, European citizens, European enterprises' needs, and to address global sustainability challenge. Open source enables anyone to access the source code. That, that's a key factor to increase trust in software, especially when you start to bring together different uh, software services, assemble them coming from different providers. Uh, it can ensure end-to-end -end, uh, security in a, in a more easy manner. Everyone can potentially audit it, even so uh, the most only advanced user will be able to have the, the knowledge. Um, but open source communities and generally the open source paradigm ensure uh, freedom of contributors and users and therefore uh, match the profound values of openness, inclusiveness, which are essential uh, for the EU. Coming back to, to the study, um, uh, we see that uh, this study will help us to drive future European policy uh, in, uh, in the software area. Uh, the study has now quantified uh, and evidenced the positive correlation of open source and economic growth. Uh, and it's now necessary for us to develop the adequate policy plan to conceptualize future policies uh, that will enable us to uh, make uh, European national public administration, industry, the research sector benefit uh, to the maximum possible extent from uh, open source. There are numer num um, many technological trends that will have a major impact on the development of software and software-based services uh, market in the, in the coming years. Uh, the digital transformation of all uh, sectors of the European economy, uh, big data, uh, blockchain, DevOps, cloud and edge technologies, cybersecurity, Internet of Things. These topics uh, all represent very dynamic market segment uh, and key drivers of European uh, innovation. But open source can be a key common denominator across the development of all those uh, technology. The Commission takes very seriously to have a competitive digital ecosystem in, uh, in Europe. Um, as we see open source as potentially a prime industrial differentiator and the basis of uh, uh, a growing range of innovative uh, products or digitally uh, enabled products, as well as new digital uh, services that can improve uh, Europe's competitiveness. So the Commission is very committed to continue uh, developing 
developing policies in, uh, in this area, and notably to look at the investment opportunities on how we can support those developments in the, in the future. So with this, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the other presentation uh, in, in, uh, in today's uh, event and looking forward to a fruitful discussion with all of you. Many thanks. Thank you, Pierre. Um, it's very interesting and I'm happy that uh, you will join the panel later on too. Uh, and you already gave a short introduction, uh, a, a tidbit, a sneak peek on the study. Um, and I'm happy that Knut will now also join me in a second. Uh, Knut Blind will join us in a second and will provide um, uh, a full presentation on the uh, economic impact and the policy recommendations, uh, who I think will come up just in one second. It's uh, always, always uh, digital events. <laughs> In a physical event, somebody just walks up the stage, but here it doesn't quite work like that. I can see he has accepted and is connecting in the in the system. Well, there we go. He's not uh, <laughs> so not coming up right now. I'm just gonna click the prompt button. Otherwise, we might uh, move up, uh, move things a little bit around. But that's just. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Paolo. <laughs> I think he changed browsers. There we are. Yeah. Hi, Knut. <laughs> I was blocked. Uh, yeah. Well, blocked. good to see you. And now I will uh, go away again and let you speak. Um, uh, you have to allow me. Um, okay. Yeah. You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, you have a full screen already? No. No. But I think it's fine. Maybe just minimize the no. other stuff the, and just go through the presentation. But now you have full screen? No, we, we just see the PowerPoint. Uh, just to, but I think if you just make the, the presentation okay. itself a bit bigger, it will be fine. It's okay to see the rest. Uh, Simon, do you hear me? Yeah, I think I already can hear you. Yeah, but if I if I if I go to full screen, then um, is that is that readable like it is? Yeah, I think yeah. Let's just leave it like this. Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks to to OFE, uh, Simon and, and its colleagues uh, for um, yeah providing another opportunity to talk about the study and also. Uh, First of all, thanks back to, to Pierre and his his unit that they they launched this this uh, study and that we have been selected. I think we, we put a lot of work uh, in into it and it was the study was more or less dominating our our life in the last yeah during the Corona crisis more or less uh, we had a, a, a real kickoff and then uh, and then Corona uh, made us work remotely. But but I think um, nevertheless it worked out quite well. Um, I'd like to to uh, talk a little bit brief about the, the core study team. I, I was coordinating it, um, and uh, kind of the, the main uh, yeah, frame of the impact assessment was was definitely developed by myself. But then we had um, uh, I, and I do it by uh, alphabetical ordering. Mirko Böhm, um, uh, also a well experienced software developer doing together with Andrew Katz, who is then guiding us through the discussion later. Uh, the, 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 they, are, they did the, the case studies. Paula and uh, Simon did the policy analysis. Um, and uh, Sashiko was also involved in uh, drafting the, the recommendations. Um, and my colleague, Torben Schubert, he did the, the econometrics. 
um, supported by some other people at Fraunhofer who put the, all the data together. Um, the commission um, asked us to do or to fulfill these five tasks. The um, main task was, was task one on, on the economic impact analysis, especially for open source software, uh, but also hardware. We'll talk about the difference later. And then there were two tasks about policy analysis uh, in the EU, uh, but also all over the world. Um, and the, the econometric study has been then complemented by the case studies. And all these things went into the um, derivation of policy recommendations will, will be also the, the end of my lecture. Um, what did we do? Uh, we looked at the literature. Um, there is a tradition now of more or less of two decades of literature on open source, uh, mainly software. There's not so much on hardware, almost nothing. Then uh, we, we checked what data we could use. I will talk about this uh, in a minute because that was also a challenge. And this went into the economic impact assessment. On the one hand, um, we also then designed a stakeholder survey to collect uh, the views of the different stakeholders in the field. Uh, then the, the case studies uh, also included some success stories just to complement then the, the quantitative study. And then uh, Paul and Steven did the um, policy, policy initiative uh, analysis. And again, this went into then the um, recommendation. Um, regarding the, the economic um, impact uh, approach, uh, we uh, uh, did it kind of yeah in, in a multiple way because um, there have been studies out on the impact of open source uh, with uh, really large numbers um, and not really validated approaches and therefore we did some cross validation. First of all, uh, the approach is, is based on a, on a cost assessment, that means we looked at what did countries, but also companies invest in, in the contribution to, uh, to open source code development. Um, um, that's, the, that's the one part. And the other part was then, okay, how to assess the benefits. Uh, here, um, this is the, the more tricky part. Um, uh, on the macroeconomic level, uh, we, uh, applied a, a growth model, which um, we have applied uh, some years ago, more or less 20 years ago, the first time to assess the economic impact of uh, standards for, for Germany. Um, and uh, I know open source is in the station not the same, but uh, they are both ki some kind of, of, uh, of a public good uh, and therefore um, did make sense. And then we had the, the stakeholder survey where we ask uh, companies and other uh, organization about the benefits, uh, and this has been complemented by the case studies. And that, that means we had a validation um, between uh, the different cost uh, assessment approaches on country and company level, but also uh, we had then a validation of the approaches uh, regarding the benefits. And, and in the last stage, we compared the, the costs and the benefits, uh, both on the country and, and on the company level, and came up with some cost benefit ratios and we also compared them. That means uh, you see here we, uh, um, we try to be quite um, uh, serious and also uh, our approach is quite conservative. Uh, uh, maybe uh, the numbers I'm going to present you are, are lower level numbers. Uh, okay. Um, what are the data sources and uh, I'm now uh, talking mainly about the, the open source software um, uh, kind of part, which, which is the major part of the study, because here we have, um, as, as also Pierre said, uh, 20 years of, of experience. Meanwhile, there's uh, the open source hardware um, uh, yeah, sector and activities are still at the very beginning. Therefore, we have not really the data to, to come up with really yeah, sophisticated econometric studies. Um, what we did, we relied on GitHub um, because this is not the only one, uh, the only repository, but but the most important one. Uh, and uh, there, um, and that was the situation: 2018, 30, uh, uh, 2 million users uh, with um, around 1.5 million organizational affiliations and, and country codes. That means we, we could do something on country level. Uh, and we had also then uh, around the same 100,000 organization on, on GitHub. Um, and we then connected that with um, 
yeah, the traditional economic data taken from the OECD or US that uh, we also considered patents. Uh, we looked at um, startups taken from Crunchbase, uh, other companies, uh, or information from MBDOs, uh, World Bank uh, data, and so on. Uh, looking at the development, these are the comments by the EU countries uh, from 2000 to 2018, and you see um, um, GitHub was then um, established around 10 years ago, and then you have this, this uh, increase, and here with the UK and, and Germany as the leading country before uh, France on the third base. Um, as you know, GitHub has, has been taken over by Microsoft uh, in, in uh, yeah, 2018, 2019. It means the 2018 figures are not uh, affected. 2019, there, there were, did you see some, some stagnation a little bit also here in the um, uh, next slide where we looked at the contributors. Um, nevertheless, uh, we just um, kind of use data provided by the two Delft um, uh, because they they downloaded all the information and uh, in 2020 um, the the um, the growth path is back that means we see still uh, increasing con contributions uh, increasing comets uh, although the exponential growth is certainly a little bit uh, yeah at, at the end uh, this has also to do with uh, maybe some demographic changes especially in Europe we see some uh, stagnation of of the labor force and therefore this is also good to see. I mean that's the 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 basis for for our um, assessments um, both on the country and company level. And uh, this cost based impact assessment, um, the the idea was to to uh, say okay, um, we we look as I said on the efforts by the member states of the EU um, and uh, in 2018 the UK was still included. Therefore. Um, uh, this is uh, also including the, the UK. Um, and we also look at the activities of the most active companies uh, which had their, their headquarter in the EU. And the basic assumption is that uh, the, the organizations or the countries uh, investing in, in the open source, means in the public domain, um, should at least outweigh uh, the, the cost. Uh, um, uh, for these investments, I mean, this is this is really the, the lower bound to say, okay, uh, the the benefits uh, at least reflect the cost invested in, in uh, contributing to open source. Um, and what do we see? Um, um, also, as a reference, uh, we have around three million employees uh, in the computer programming sector in the EU in 2018. Uh, and what we've also found around 260,000 contributors to GitHub, um, which are located uh, at the EU, and that means these are slightly less than 10% of the employees in the computer programming sector. Uh, and if we calculate the, the, the personal cost, uh, assuming that, they, uh, that these people would kind of work full time for kind of uh, writing open source code, this would be an investment of 14 billion um, euros in 2018. Um, on the other hand, we also looked at the comments. That means here again, uh, we have some other uh, robustness um, check. Uh, that means we, we, look, we look both on the number of contributors and the number of comments. Uh, and here uh, we use the constructive cost model, also used by others, and they come up with 16,000 uh, full-time equivalents, which would be an, um, an investment of around 1 billion euro. Uh, that means that's, um, that's in line with, with these 14 billion, because here the assumption is that the people would work full-time on developing open course. That means, that means we have already some indication about um, the cost from the country perspective. Then what we also did is we looked at the, the companies most actively. Um, and here um, we, we got a sample of around uh, 2000 and they uh, are responsible for more than 12% of the contributors and one third of the comments. Uh, uh, and in total, they employ uh, more than, than 1 million employees. And this is a, a figure which we can put in context to a previous study long, uh, published in 2005, 2006, uh, where the, the global uh, employment of companies contributing to open source was around 1 uh, million, but especially not in the EU. And what we also see is uh, there's a very high share of, of, of small and even very small companies 
It means 75% have one uh, less than 100 employees. And on the other hand, what we also see, the, the smaller the company is, the, the more contributors are listed and the more comments they provide. Uh, it means all, almost 50% by companies uh, which, which have less than 50 employees. Uh, and, uh, and especially um, uh, small companies uh, between 1,100 employees invest more than 5% of their full-time equivalents to, uh, to open source. It means overall, if we take these figures together with the macro figures, um, uh, this, this, uh, this fits together. That means we have a, a valid approach uh, looking at the cost side. Now, the benefit side. This is a little bit uh, a tricky exercise, and I'm not going into the econometrics, uh, but um, what we found is that um, uh, the contribution to, to open source is, is uh, 0.04. What does it mean? That means, uh, especially between 2017 and 2018, and even before, we have uh, around 10% uh, growth rates. Uh, the, in, in the con in the comments uh, and this means that um, uh, these these increasing uh, investment in in open source that means in the comments uh, would contribute to 0.4 percent of the GDP in the EU uh, and uh, and if we take uh, the, the numbers um, this will then that, that means the total GDP in 2018 in the in the EU uh, was was about uh, 16,000 billion that means um, uh, the 0.4 percent are 36 billion per year. Um, uh, we also did that with uh, looking at the number of contributors, uh, like other employees, uh, which which is normally used as an input indicator in these growth models. And here we come up uh, with a, a slightly higher elasticity of 0.6. Uh, therefore, uh, we get to 95 billions per year. Uh, that means overall um, we see really significant uh, benefits um, of the EU um, economy from the global pool of, of open source uh, and especially from the pool contributed by the, the, the uh, contributors located in the EU or the comets uh, which, which can, could be attributed to the EU. And as I said before, um, this is a lower level because only uh, yeah, less than half of the contributors or comets can be allocated to a specific country. However, overall, if we if we kind of uh, think uh, beyond the the COVID nineteen crisis, uh, and if, when we are back on the on the the normal growth rate, uh, we could expect uh, more than one hundred billion um, euros per year. Uh, that open source is contributing to the GDP of the EU, uh, including the UK. If we exclude the UK, it's around two thirds of this uh, number. But uh, as I said, in 2018, the UK was still a member of the EU. Um, and what we then did, we, we uh, put the costs and the benefits together. And um, uh, we also took into account that the source code developed in 2018 um, or, or, or the, the impact of, of source codes goes not only back to the code which has been developed 2018, but also in previous years. And here uh, we looked on the survival rate of code and assumed, okay, we take the last five years uh, on the one hand. And also we, we took into account that uh, the software developers uh, do not only spend time, they, they also maybe need hardware. And here we, we put a quite high um, assumption. That means uh, we have some figures about the investment in hardware in the IT sector. And, and overall, we get to a cost-benefit ratio to one to, to four. Um, and there, there have been other studies, especially in the US, which looked at the, the contribution of ICT hardware uh, on, on GDP or also on innovation expenditure in general. And uh, they come up also with a minimum kind of cost benefit ratio of one to five, uh, which can then go up to one to 10. Yeah? That means uh, we are in the same, same range. It means the contribution, especially uh, to yeah, a knowledge pool yeah, um, 
uh, or to innovation in, in, in general uh, is, is creating really significant benefits for, for the economy at a macro level. Uh, at, the, at the micro level, um, we had the stakeholder survey a little bit as, as an, an approach to, to get some information here uh, from the um, uh, from the stakeholders. Um, uh, and the, the idea was then um, also to, to ask a little bit for the softer factors. Um, overall, uh, the, the survey was really broadly distributed also due to the uh, support of the Eclipse Foundation um, means we got uh, more than 100, 900 responses at, at the end. We had some tricky question in it, I, I, I admit, uh, therefore we, we got around 100 uh, total responses. Um, and what were the main findings? That means um, why are um, people contribute uh, to or companies contribute to, to open source? Uh, it's it's really finding technical solutions or contributing also forward the state of the art of technology, also to avoid vendor lock-in, um, and it's also uh, an instrument to for knowledge seeking and knowledge uh, creation. Um, the benefits are especially seen in really supporting open standards and interoperability, uh, also uh, getting a better access to to source code. And uh, as um, already related to the incentives here, uh, independence from prop propriety providers of software. Um, the cost aspects are overall less relevant. Um, here, sometimes error issues uh, and stability issues are, are named. And uh, the, another aspect is, is the cost for skilled labor. Here, uh, what has also mentioned by Pierre that, that here skills is key. Uh, and we, we asked them people then also for um, cost benefit ratios and and overall they, they come up uh, with, with also ratios one to 10 uh, as the ratio of what was named most often, which is very kind of similar to, to the one we came up in the macro study. Um, it means overall uh, we see uh, on the one hand significant investments uh, by the EU countries um, and the EU located companies into open source um, with, with a kind of baseline investment of 1 billion per year. Um, and here we, we also kind of yeah, underestimated that uh, because we um, did not really uh, have the, the numbers for uh, the, the, the exact wages of developers. Therefore, it could be certainly higher. Uh, at, at the benefit side, um, overall, the number is that uh, if we increase our contribution to, to open source, uh, it will generate around uh, additional 100 billion um, euros in the EU per year, taking still uh, the, the, the UK on board. Um, uh, uh, and another uh, interesting insight, and here uh, I'd like to thank also Frank Nagel from Harvard Business School, who supported the, the, the study team um, because uh, they um, did a study on the contribution of open source uh, to, to startups on a global base, and we took their approach and applied it to the EU. And what we find is that here, uh, we could also expect that the contribution to open source uh, generates around 1,000 ICT-based startups per year in the EU, and that's also a very uh, positive uh, impact. Um, uh, from the case studies, uh, which I, I didn't talk too much about, we, we also learned that uh, the public sector is benefiting from uh, uh, open source in, in saving of total cost of ownerships and, again, avoiding vendor login. And uh, there are further benefits of open source, and this is this is uh, related to openness. Uh, here, standards and 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 uh, independence, and maybe also digital sovereignty is an issue. Uh, but also uh, labor cost savings uh, is 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 a topic. And here, I also would like to refer, refer to the Bitcom Open Source Monitor, which has been launched uh, in 2020. The first uh, edition, and they will update that now. And I'm, uh, I'm curious to see uh, the results. And here, especially companies said, okay, we are saving a lot of um, development uh, cost and, and uh, labor cost for developers, which are a very kind of rare species. Um, and, and therefore, this is this is an important cost saving aspect. Um, now, um, especially from the from the case studies and the success cases, 
uh, we derived a, a SWOT analysis. Um, that means we looked at the strengths and weaknesses for the European economy, but also on the opportunities and threats. And uh, we, we structure this uh, according to political, P, economic, social, and technological aspects. And what are the, the, the strengths? Um, it's, it's about uh, the, the growth potential of the EU single market. That means we have a, a, a common regulatory framework that's positive. Uh, we have really uh, an, a diverse, uh, innovative SME ecosystem. Uh, there is uh, support for the culture of collaboration in this ecosystem. And uh, we have also a growing profile of open technologies across uh, European ICT uh, sector companies. Weakness, uh, there's still uh, some lag in the implementation um, uh, of open source. There are also some legal issues uh, related to IP and sanitation. Maybe we can discuss that later. Uh, from the economic perspective, um, there are still big players, uh, the big techs, uh, which which are dominating the market, um, and uh, and it's that's 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 tough. Yeah? Um, uh, from a from a social perspective, there is still maybe limited recognition of the economic role of the open source communities, and hopefully the study will change that a little bit. Um, and uh, there's also, from a technological perspective, a gap because we have good technologies, but but uh, there's a gap to to really make them into really successfully commercially success, successfully products in Europe. For the futures, uh, what is what are the opportunities? Um, from the political perspective, we have the EU single market, the Digital Single Market Act. Uh, um, uh, and, the, and the Digital Market Act uh, are maybe also uh, future frameworks which, which can help. Uh, um, uh, from an economic perspective, uh, we might have the opportunity to promote flagship pro projects and maybe centers of excellence. Uh, we see that already a little bit in the, in the hardware sector. Um, then uh, from the social perspective, um, it's, it's seen that uh, open source is also contributing maybe to the su sustainable development goals. That means that's 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 an important aspect. And from a technological perspective, um, we have uh, the opportunities to to use this diversity of of net of the network and the player to come up with with technologies which which are um, really addressing customer needs, but also maybe sustainability issues. The threats, um, there is still the threat that uh, the good and, and really attractive startups and SEVs are taken over by the big techs. Um, uh, also, uh, here, administrative barriers in the public sector still might play a, a role. Um, from the economic perspective, the, the dominance of the U.S. Co companies um, uh, is, is still a big challenge and could be also a threat. From a social perspective, also a brain drain of talent. Uh, to U.S. and Asia is 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 an issue uh, because these people follow follow the funding opportunities which are still limited in in EU. Um, uh, from a technological perspective, um, the cloud might be a, a, a kind of a, yeah, a threat for for the future development of open source. But maybe later uh, about that. I have to speed up a little bit um, now. Policy recommendations. Um, this is the overview of, um, we restructured them um, and uh, we have kind of three pillars. Um, the, the first pillar is um, addressing instruments which help to uh, get to a digitally ad autonomous public sector. Um, the second one is about open R&D enabling European growth. And the third one about digitized internationally competitive industry. Means here um, in the first, uh, three um, um, uh, yeah policy domains. Uh, it's about uh, really building up institutional capacity, uh, uh, and here the, the op open source policy offices uh, might be help uh, full for the public sector um, uh, within the uh, European Commission. Um, uh, it, it, there's an issue, but also maybe. Uh, to build up European networks of these ASPOs, uh, maybe fund uh, the developing of, of new ones, uh, and then take these actors and bring them together in an ASPO uh, network. Uh, and, uh, and this should help them to establish a European open source culture 
uh, by these OSPOs. Um, legitimacy is an issue. Um, uh, we, we still see here a problem, but here we, we could address, and maybe we can discuss, discuss this also later, that digital autonomy and technical sovereignty might be, uh, can be achieved via open source and, and also open source should be considered as a public infrastructure like other uh, public infrastructures. Strategic intelligence, that means we need more data. That means we also had the challenge of getting the right data for our, our study. That means here, uh, open source should be integrated in the data collection activities by US, uh, the, the European uh, uh, Statistical Office. Um, and we have already the open source observatory and uh, this can be expanded by uh, more uh, kind of elements of strategic um, um, intelligence. That means more uh, information, especially maybe also forward looking information. Now regarding R&D, um, uh, the funding um, is an issue. That means uh, here one should focus on, on open source project, although being still maybe following the principle of technical uh, neutrality, uh, which has been also mentioned by Pierre. Uh, and then especially SMEs and startups have often problems to enter these programs. And here maybe there, there is, is the need to, to really ease the access and maybe construct specific programs for that. Um, regarding diffusion, knowledge creation is good, but the, the economic impact and social impact is only generated if it's diffused. Uh, and, um, and that we also see by the results of, of our study. And one aspect is maybe really making the, the, the results, uh, including the code, open accessible, which have been funded by, by the public sector, um, and, and also maybe the creation of uh, open source platforms or networks, or kind of expanding existing one like the, 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 the foundations, which, which uh, for example, like Eclipse, have been moved to, to the EU, uh, to Europe, uh, might be another instrument to, to push this, this aspect. Entrepreneurship, um, I already mentioned quite often that the, the micro companies, the startups are key. Um, and what we see on the other hand, we, we see a little bit of lack of that these, these startups take off. And here, here maybe we need to provide more education um, uh, and also maybe try to maybe help them by, by promoting partnerships maybe with, with either intermediaries, again, uh, foundations, or maybe even larger companies. Uh, human cap capital is, is key. Uh, we have, we have a, 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 a lack of skilled labor, um, especially in, in the IT and in the developer area, and this will uh, become even, even more crucial when uh, the, the baby boomers start to, to retire in the, in the next years or have already maybe started to do so. And uh, here, our higher education institutions have to uh, make a move. Uh, they have to, to address open source much, much broader uh, in, in their curricula, in their programs. This is not yet the case. This is really a, a problem. Uh, and uh, maybe also promoting uh, that, that they offer uh, management skills or entrepreneurial skills because it's open source success is not only about um, the, 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 the quality of the code, it's also about having really entrepreneurial and management skills to commercialize this. Um, maybe a European certification scheme uh, is an issue because this would help to uh, reduce friction in the labor market. You know? and, uh, and diversity is an issue. Uh, because uh, the, the open source developers is, is, a, is a male business uh, and it's even higher than in the proprietary uh, software sector. Therefore, uh, here uh, maybe diversity uh, um, programs or enhancing programs are needed. Then it's also about money. Um, and uh, there might be different approaches. Uh, maybe tax incentives um, could be an issue for, for contributions to open source. Uh, we have some funding schemes already uh, in, in the EU and Europe, and uh, that might be kind of also expanded to open source based startups. Uh, also, especially, uh, also not only addressing the starting phase, but, but especially the growth phase. And uh, last point, especially SMEs could also be a benefit from maybe pre commercial or, or public procurement uh, programs in general, which especially uh, support innovative 
uh, open source solutions. And here again, Frank Nagel showed that uh, a change in the law in France uh, really made the difference. And here yeah, maybe uh, we, we can join them. And that means other member states could, could do the same. Um, regulation, the regulatory environment uh, is also playing a, an important role. And here maybe Andrew Katz can jump in later on this. Liability regimes are still uh, a little shaky here. That's one aspect. The other point is security issues. Um, open source is certainly uh, a, a way to increase um, the security level of open source, but we see also that uh, the investment in, in this aspect is, is quite low, as um, a study by, uh, again, coordinated by Frank Nagel under the, the roof of the Linux Foundation showed. Uh, um, with Mirko Mipbim, we did already a study on open source standardization uh, to improve the interface. Uh, we see some uh, significant improvement in the last two years. Um, that means some organizations try to uh, to benefit from both uh, sources in, in order to to improve their their specifications. Um, as I already mentioned, public procurement um, is, is a regulatory instrument, and we have a public procurement directive, but uh, which is referring to standards, but not to open source. And finally, also uh, the IPR regimes, that means the European copyright and patent legislation, should really uh, consider in, in future revisions the aspect of open source, which has been not yet the case. Uh, market creation, um, also in competition platform policies, open source should be addressed. Um, that's not yet uh, the case, or, although we know that especially the big platform providers rely in their business models and also in their technology and, and open source contributions. And I just read uh, yesterday there was a new study from China and open source, and here also the, the big China the Chinese players are, are really having increased their investment, and also from a global perspective that's an issue. Um, and open source could be also explicitly included in the SME policies and, and channel because what we have seen that the SMEs, and especially the micro companies, play important role here. Um, to open source hardware, uh, very brief, there are different um, aspects um, which maybe uh, Andrew Katz can then uh, later um, a little bit kind of elaborate further uh, some, some aspects uh, on, on this. Um, and then we had also some domain specific recommendations uh, with the last one also uh, open source can also help to to uh, promote uh, the implementation of the of for example the green deal that that's uh, that's uh, that's important potential uh, we have also to to exploit in the in the near future in summary uh, to to come to an end here now um, uh, uh, we see there's a large economic impact, and um, we have seen the studies now also about China. Some things are going on in the US. I haven't seen yet, not yet the last results. That means there's an impact. Um, and uh, and there's a, also a strong role for public policy to, to really exploit this public good character of open source uh, and also maybe to in incentivize uh, further contributions because we have also the challenge that maybe the, the contributors are, are becoming really aware spacey. Um, but overall, as you have seen, we have um, um, 13 different policy areas with, with different sub recommendations, uh, adding up to more than 30 recommendations. We need a very comprehensive, coordinated approach. Uh, and, and we have also to set up this institutional capacity in the different various layers, that means both at the European Commission layer, but also at the member states layer and even at the, layers, uh, at the regional layer in the public sector to really at the end, um, yeah, uh, leverage and exploit the potential of open source in Europe. Thank you. That was it. And I stop here. Thank you, Knut. I think there's a lot to digest now uh, for the audience. That wasn't just a few slides. Uh, to help you a little bit with digesting all of this, uh, we'll start our panel now. So that means that um, uh, our panel of, uh, well, you, Knut Blind, uh, Pierre Chastanet, Jutta Kort, and Regan McDonald uh, are going to join me in a second, and uh, Andrew Katz, who is going to moderate the panel. I'm sure people will show up. There we are. Andrew is here. That's good. Hello. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can Excellent. hear you. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. 
Hi, Hi. Reagan. Hello. Nice to see you again. And then we're only missing uh, Jota Kort and Pierre Chastanet, who I think is still there. So let's see if we can uh, jump back in. Um, otherwise, I think maybe, uh, Andrew, while we wait, maybe let's already start um, uh, since we are since we only have half an hour left. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's, let's try try to accelerate things a little bit. Um, so, Simon, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, and uh, Knut, um, excellent presentation. You managed to condense what we up to four hundred and thirty five pages or something at last count. So uh, that was a challenge, which I think you rose to extremely well. And uh, Pierre, thank you very much indeed for your keynote and uh, gradually expanding our, our our knowledge of where things are going next. So that was that was absolutely superb. Um, I uh, uh, this is the first time I've moderated anything, so um, apologies if I'm not getting this this quite right. Um, what I will be doing is asking some um, initial questions, but I'm also um, very keen to have questions uh, from the audience as well. So if you want to pop questions in the chat, um, I will certainly do my best um, to, uh, to to ask them. Uh, it's entirely possible that uh, unfortunately I won't be able to do all of those, uh, but I'll, I'll certainly and so I'll apologize in advance um, for that. Um, so um, while um, we're waiting to see whether Yuta can uh, manage to get the technology to work properly, let's um, kick off. Um, and I think I'll probably start by um, asking Reagan a question, if I may. Um, so obviously Mozilla's regarded as being very much uh, a poster child um, of the uh, uh, amongst open source organisations, um, and I'm. I'm always a little concerned that that uh, we, we have sort of an issue with survivorship bias here. When we're talking to organizations that are very successful, um, then we're going to get a, a particular viewpoint from them. So the initial question I was going to ask was, um, you know, is o open source software vital to Mozilla's success? And I'm assuming that the answer to that is going to be yes. So I will move then swiftly on to the supplemental question, um, which is what characteristics of open source? And I mean, by that, I mean, in the wider sense, community development model, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think um, are vital to Mozilla's success? Thanks, Andrew, and I'm glad you went straight to the second question because <laughs> the, the first question is really easy to answer. Um, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this conversation and also congrats on a very comprehensive report. It's great to see the correlation between open source and financial well-being and community and all of these great things. And I think it's also worth acknowledging that open source has really come a long way um, even 10, 20 years ago, uh, when Firefox, for instance, first open sourced its code, it was actually quite controversial. Uh, and so, you know, having gone from that into now something over 90% of all enterprises have at least some sort of open source component in their day to day operations is just, I think, really um, heartening to, to acknowledge. And I'm glad to see the European. Commission um, commissioning these studies, and I, I hope they uh, take on a lot of these recommendations. So maybe um, I can uh, talk a little bit about, well, maybe a quick background about Mozilla for those who may not be aware uh, of us, and then I can talk, actually, there was one particular characteristic that I wanted to highlight about the, the open source um, community, I think, for us, reflecting on what's been successful in our view. Um, but, you know, Mozilla is a mission-driven technology company. We're both a nonprofit and a, a technology company. We were creators of Firefox, um, the open source browser, but also many other sort of Firefox family products like Firefox Focus and Pocket, which are used by hundreds of millions of users around the world. And um, we have used a lot of these different open, open practices, as we call them, not just open source. And this is really, I think, in terms of success, given Mozilla a way to compete asymmetrically with a lot of much larger organizations with a lot more resources. And to give you a sense of our scale, in 2018, about 14,000 individual commercial volunteers worked with us to build and to test and to debug and deploy our software, making it um, over 52% of our contributions community-driven. So. I think that's maybe the one piece that I wanted to, to highlight um, that is mentioned in this report. And I think that is a really crucial component when thinking about open source and um, 
making sure to scale and to upkeep and also maintain the longevity of open source. And, and that's really community. And to think about um, embracing open source beyond code and to consider it as a strategy. Uh, and so some of the ways we have done that is to prioritize open culture and to think beyond the code. So thinking about open practices and how you engage with external communities. Um, another thing that we, we have done is to try to be very strategic about the kind of code that we build. So we think a lot about open by design. Um, so thinking about the purpose and the strategy and the value to the broader ecosystem. So what is the community contributing to? And in our view, that has helped maintain that longevity um, and to keep up with the upkeep of a lot of software. And then, and the other issue um, that we've looked at uh, is again, looking at communities really expansively. So the value of um, social connections and valuing people's contributions that are both paid and unpaid uh, contributions has just been really uh, valuable. So I think that would be, I, I guess, um, one of the secret sauce elements that has maintained Mozilla in our uh, product development over, you know, over two decades uh, mm -hmm. on this. So, yeah. Uh, do you, and do you feel that that's translatable to other organizations? This is just something that uniquely works within within Mozilla. I think this is a, a hallmark of really successful open source projects. So GitHub also is similar to this, many other open source projects, but you'll notice that those that work really well have a strong community, have a clear mission, and people are sort of understanding that they're contributing to something. So I think this actually brings, mm -hmm. you know, what the commission mentioned, what Pierre mentioned in the in his keynote around, um, you know, the the public benefit of this and the fact that open source can also help bring European communities together. Um, so uh, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Pierre, can I move on to you next? Um, because um, so given what Reagan uh, just, just said about the, the um, importance of, of community, um, and also a few weeks ago, um, we had a new industrial strategy that was published by the European Commission. Uh, so how does open source fit in with that? Yes, um, um, the, the, that's a very good question. As, uh, so uh, we, um, uh, as digital is a key enabler of um, um, all sectors of the of the European economy, and we start seeing every sector undertaking uh, digital transformation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we see open source as a bit of uh, something cross-cutting. But at the same time, uh, on a sectoral basis, uh, especially when you need to have like uh, a lot of data sharing or industrial ecosystem working together, open source can really be a differentiator in terms of trust among these different competing industrial actors to be able to uh, exchange data, have open um, uh, software that will uh, enable to interface with each other to make the entire industrial ecosystem more efficient. So that's uh, one area where we see uh, a great potential for open source in the in the coming decade, and that we will try to foster uh, on a on a sector by sector basis. So. Yeah. Okay. So if open source um, helps to make industry more efficient on a on a an organizational by organization basis, um, then uh, there's also a question about the sort of the interrelationship between organizations um, in different countries as well. And I think that probably then leads us into the question uh, of digital sovereignty. Um, and um, if I may, Yuta, welcome. Um, I'd very much like to to ask you um, because I know that um, when Germany um, uh, uh, took over the presidency um, of the uh, European Council last year. Uh, one of the uh, things that was widely talked about was the importance of, of digital sovereignty um, and um, of technological autonomy. Um, could you talk about that a little bit, please? Of course, thank you. And uh, we thought uh, it is uh, important um, to create the right conditions for Europe to develop and uh, deploy our own key digital capacities, including uh, the deployment of secure cloud infrastructure and interoperable services that fully comply with European legal provisions and ethical values. And um, all these aspects are addressed by the Berlin Declaration, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was officially, you said, uh, uh, adopted in December of the last year and um, in the German presidency. 
and uh, the signatories therefore uh, agreed among other things uh, to implement common standards um, modular architectures and and when suitable um, open source technologies in the development and deployment mm -hmm. of cross-border digital solution in the member states and the strengthening of European uh, digital sovereignty plays a key role for German BME. And uh, we in the BME promote a trustful and human-centered uh, digital uh, uh, transition. And uh, the German administration cloud strategy and the center of digital um, sovereignty are two examples um, how we already uh, implement the principles of the Berlin Declaration. That's uh, um, at first for the Berlin Declaration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, and um, I think everyone has mentioned the the sort of human centric um, nature of open source software development. Um, and Knut, if I can come to you, because one of the things that um, um, also comes out in the study um, is that is the question of, of community. Um, but to what extent do you feel, and this is probably a question that I, I shouldn't ask um, an economist, uh, to, to what extent do you feel that um, the, the impact of uh, collaboration um, is really the sort of greatest benefit in terms of, from pure economic perspective, lowering costs when you're developing software, developing innovation, et cetera, et cetera? Or do you believe that there is also um, a, a sort of human factor in there as well, um, in the, the sort of sociological um, coming together of individuals um, in developing through open source projects is is something that um, is, is sort of equally a benefit that maybe, maybe can't be uh, quantified economically? Um, yeah, indeed, it's a little bit a challenging question for an economist. Um, nevertheless, um, we we didn't address this in in our empirical study, which is really was focused on on the numbers on on really the, the hard numbers. However, we also screened the literature and and this issue of community building um, and and these soft uh, impact factors are definitely uh, an important uh, aspect, uh, which. Um, is at least uh, I think um, supported by by the, the the assessment of the incentives and and uh, when you're looking at, at this question on incentives uh, to our stakeholder survey that means here uh, this this incentive to contribute maybe also to to the development of code to to tackle progress uh, that that was uh, highly rated and. Uh, um, also um, from from other studies, uh, also the, the the German Bitcoms open source monitor uh, shows this this is important. And uh, together with Mirko, we did two years ago this study on the comparison between open source and synchronization, and and both activities uh, are really um, uh, on the one hand there is certainly a commercial interest, but there is still also this this very intrinsic um, and uh, yeah. Uh, interest and uh, there's there are studies about yeah what motivates uh, researchers and um, and and it's it's reputation on the one hand that that's also an aspect but still there's this this uh, motive to 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 solve puzzles that means also to contribute to the good and maybe also contribute to uh, uh, the society but I I'd like to come back to Pierre um, I just checked the 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 update of the industrial strategy and uh, I was very pleased to see that uh, uh, you you decided to uh, to go for the development of a European standardization strategy uh, that's one one key element but. Um, uh, unfortunately, what I miss in this strategy is is the topic of open source. This has been not not really addressed at all, and that's uh, I think that our common uh, yeah uh, future future objective. We, we have to push that really further. That especially in such strategic documents, uh, the topic of open source is is really reflected or is at least considered uh, in the next editions. That's a little bit my my point. Was there a discussion at all uh, on this topic when 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 there was uh, the discussion about the update of the industrial strategy? 
Yeah, that was definitely part of our input. But uh, as you can imagine, this is uh, this sort of document are the fruit of uh, mm -hmm. many consensus uh, internally in the in the institution. As this is a broad industrial strategy, no, so not only looking at the uh, digital transformation aspect. So uh, open source was just one out of so many considerations to, to factor in. Uh, but uh, this is something that we uh, definitely continue pushing for. Uh, Stay tuned, there will be more to Excellent. come. Excellent. <laughs> um, Knut, we have um, sort of one question that's uh, come in from the audience. So um, Stefan uh, Famigier asks, um, uh, so the figures that, uh, that, that, that you gave um, on the impact of um, open source development are very, very interesting. Um, but um, how do you know um, what the causation is? So we, is that just a, a correlation or, 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 or uh, do you believe that there is a causation there as well? Um, uh, we we uh, um, we did not really uh, just uh, one correlation analysis. Uh, this is a kind of a long-term panel analysis where we we looked at time series and looked how the the, the input uh, into uh, open source had an, had an influence on on the the, the, the change in, in in the output. I mean in, in GDP. Uh, I have to, I have to admit. Um, there are, normally it would be better to control than for some external shock to really exclude completely the uh, the, the, the so-called endogeneity problem. That means uh, uh, which which way is the is the uh, causation going? That means maybe you can also argue uh, if the GDP goes up, then there is maybe more resources uh, which can go into in, into open source. However. Yeah. Um, Frank Nagel did some um, studies where he looked, uh, for example, in France uh, at the, with, with the shock of the change of the public procurement law, where he then really had this external kind of uh, shock, uh, which you use then in order to control for this uh, causality problem, in, in order to show how the, the causality works, that it, it works really from open source uh, to the, for example, more higher number of startups, uh, more people working in IT, uh, also uh, then at the end also contributing the, to, to economic growth. And, uh, and therefore, we, we can rely on, 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 on this specific work and also his uh, work on, on the startup or the, the influence of open source and startup, because here you could also argue that if you have more startups, then they contribute more to open source and you have a, a reverse causality. But uh, he could apply some sophisticated uh, instruments to control for that, and therefore um, the, 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 the causality is clear, and we, we use a 20 years time panel and, and not just a pure co correlation analysis. Yeah, okay, okay. And there's some interesting um, uh, discussion going on in the chat as well about the extent to which various characteristics uh, are not necessarily um, able to be captured in, in terms of um, any form of economic analysis. And I think, you know, we, yeah. we would all, all agree with that. Um, so, um, you know, I'd now um, like to ask Reagan, if I may, because I, I read the um, uh, the Mozilla Manifesto and the Ten Principles um, a while ago, which is very interesting, um, and um, you know, it, it, and it it, it, um, it talks a lot about community benefit. It talks about um, empowerment of individuals, human beings, um, and, and a lot of stuff that um, you know. I think I think every, everyone would, would think is fundamentally important. But what's very interesting in there, it also talks about the the necessity of creating. Um, uh, commercial activity within the world of the internet and open source, how vital that is, and how you need to strike a balance between commercial activity um, and individuals' rights, freedom, freedoms, dignities, um, and, and all of that. Um, so uh, could you expand on that a little bit, please? Um, I think that I, it, it's an interesting uh, principle that that you picked out, and and it's one that we go back to a lot, um, with especially with regards actually to open source software when we're mm -hmm. building products. And it's something we sometimes have to remind people, uh, like journalists or even you know policymakers, that Mozilla is very focused. Well, we're you know a not for profit. Caring, we care a lot about the individual, empowering people, and you know as a browser, we consider that the the user agent. So we really want to empower people and protect them um, to, you know, be empowered to, to have their own uh, online experience. But we also want to acknowledge that this striking this balance between public and private 
um, is really important. And there's a lot of value in having, uh, you know, striking that right balance. So, um, you know, whether it's open source uh, products or if it's, you know, um, advertising online, uh, there's all sorts of different um, uh, sort of the, the right balance where you can have uh, you can pursue, you know, uh, you could have a business, I guess, like Mozilla, which is which is technically, you know, a, a, a business, uh, but also not driven only by profit. So I guess I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think um, it's a really important uh, principle for us to always keep in mind that you need both sort of public and private investment. And this has been when the, the web has been the best at its best when these two mix um, and when one doesn't overpower the other. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think um, it, it makes sense to think of the different domains um, actually keeping each other honest to a degree. So part of the open source dynamic being that, um, you know, if an organization running um, a project may be dominating that project, but if they become evil, then everyone has the, the right to fork the project. Um, and that's a, a sort of dynamic that means that it's less likely that the sponsoring organization is going to do that in the first place. Um, but it also means that there is there is ultimately um, a, a safety net there as well. Um, yes. And and I think I think building in the open with open practices and using open source software mitigates against the evil uh, yes. issue because you don't have to just trust you can verify and anyone yeah. can verify. And, and yeah. I think that's one of the, the, the greatest values, uh, you know, around trust uh, for open source is that it is collaborative and you can look under the hood and see what's going on and, you know, not only contribute to it, but also um, see what's going on under there. And I think that uh, in terms of the, the you know, evilness uh, is, is often not being able to understand what's what's going on and what's happening. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, open source technology and approaches really sort of mitigate against that risk. And again, I think help achieve that sort of balance of making profit, but not being evil. So here's a, here's, here's a uh, following on from that. Here's a question that I'm, I'm going to throw open to, to the whole panel, really, um, which is, um, does the increasing prevalence of cloud technology and the fact that it is easier to hide that open source and the development that's going on behind the cloud and it becomes therefore um, more difficult um, to, to, to access the source code and exercise the rights that you would have um, under an open source license or free software license, um, has, has that disrupted the the dynamic at all? Is that something we need to be aware of? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get started if uh, if nobody picks it up. Yes, please. Uh, uh, so yeah, in Europe, we definitely the, the benefit, I, I'll take up on a, on a particular stack, but uh, uh, OpenStack has really demonstrated um, uh, in Europe its capacity to boost uh, uh, the delivery of European grown cloud-based services uh, because it has literally reduced the cost of licensing to zero for those companies to operate a, a cloud stack and really focus on the on the infrastructure and this has really uh, allowed quite a number of actors to survive to remain actually very competitive and compete with uh, the large global hyperscalers and currently uh, this creates a, a very uh, successful growing uh, European ecosystem. Now, let me take this one step further and mm -hmm. uh, say that uh, this is uh, this has actually created uh, the baseline to create a, a multi-cloud uh, environment for Europe. Uh, because as you have all these actors that are more or less using uh, the, the same stack or slightly uh, different flavors of the, of the same stack, uh, it enables uh, to have easier interconnection of those uh, different players and actually create a European federation of cloud service providers. So we are really convinced that this, this will foster uh, uh, competition uh, while uh, making sure that there is uh, interconnection of different competing uh, services across the, the EU and let the user choose depending on their needs, depending on um, uh, where they decide to open a sales branch or uh, uh, whatever business you need in this or that European country and get mm -hmm. local availability via these providers. So this is clearly very important for um, the digital sovereignty, digital autonomy. Um, so um, Jutta, if I can, can ask you on that topic, 
Um, what do you say to people who say that um, developing uh, digital autonomy is really just another word for saying that the um, European Union is becoming protectionist and it just wants to um, close down the, the, the influence of the, um, the large, mainly US corporations? Uh, no, I think it's not uh, um, our, our point, but uh, uh, because we in the uh, German uh, government have to um, uh, strengthen um, um, our um, our digital so sovereignty, and we see uh, that the solution is uh, to make uh, it uh, by. Um, um, uh, by um, open source um, software and uh, so we are um, in at this point at uh, um, um, in the uh, European uh, um, standard we want to um, make a proof of concept and mm -hmm. um, we want to um, 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 let me uh, show um, oh Jutta, I think we've we've lost you unfortunately we have some some technological problems um, I'm afraid so hopefully we will get to um, Yuta back again um, yeah. in a moment yeah. no, she's, she's back you were there for a moment and then you went again. No, okay. Sorry, this is this is the, the, the modern world. Unfortunately, um, hopefully, we'll be able to get you back um, um, uh, back soon. Um, um, so, if I can um, um, sort of move to um, uh, Pierre now. Um, I mean, what what do you think um, the, the the sort of the the, the broadest possible policy recommendations as far as um, open source um, should look? Um, could you could you talk about that briefly? Yes, I'll I'll be brief on on this because that, that that's really part actually of the uh, what we need to finalize with the with the study to look uh, a bit deeper at the, mm -hmm. at the policy recommendation and actually what uh, done on our own what we're going to do with it. Um, maybe uh, that was the subject of uh, of earlier um, uh, discussion uh, under the umbrella of OFE, but uh, just to highlight the fact that the Commission is walking the talk uh, for the uh, European institutions themselves. So. Um, uh, the Commission is promoting the use of open source uh, within the institution as part of the uh, digital public sector modernization of the European uh, institution. We adopted uh, a dedicated strategy for, for this purpose. Um, so now, uh, well, the Berlin Declaration was a, was a first step to uh, engage with the member state to actually uh, share uh, these sort of uh, best practices uh, on uh, uh, digital transformation of the of the public sector, including through the use of uh, of open source. Um, we we have uh, to see how we bring this uh, further now. Uh, so we have identified, well quantified the uh, the, the benefits. Uh, that's really key outcome of the of the study. We have mm -hmm. done very solid uh, evidence collection. Uh, now we need to uh, to do the. Um, uh, internal policy conceptualization to see how we can bring this further. Right, right. Um, so one of the, the sort of um, recommendations that got some of the most um, interest in the chat was um, expanding um, the um, already very good work that the European Union has done in, in terms of open source program offices. Um, so uh, the, the idea of expanding that program, um, and this is really a question that I, I throw out to the whole panel. Uh, do we do, do we see that as being something that is limited to um, open source software, or do we see that expanding to open hardware, open data, and potentially other forms of openness as well? So Knut, I don't know if um, you want to respond to that one. Yeah, I think I think uh, what we see is is he, here and there that that uh, OSPOs are now installed uh, um, at different levels, uh, and I think that's that's a first step. But but I think we have still to go uh, some some way to to get really this this rolled out this this principle. And if we have then 
this kind of institutional change or or build up this institutional capacity um then um then one might go one one step further yeah and in 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 areas uh, which which you have mentioned but but i think uh, we are not yet there that we could say okay we have already uh, the the institutional capacity at the different layers mm -hmm. of the public sector which is needed to exploit uh, the potential we have identified i think this is still uh, some some way to go and and this is uh, not a short term a quick win yeah that means you have to establish the people and the people have to probably uh, they have to fight yeah mm -hmm. that means uh, even if if they are there they have to convince then all the surrounding uh, kind of uh, employees in in their in their public institutions that that uh, open source uh, could really help uh, to change the game yeah? and and uh, therefore um, first we have to have them make best at all layers in, in, in a very broad coverage. Yeah? And, and we have that, then it needs some time until they then are convincing uh, maybe the, the whole public sector, but then maybe also develop some community of practice or, or some mm -hmm. expertise. Uh, this has to grow. And, and, and as I said, it's, it's really key to have the right people and, and uh, they have the skills, they understand the communities or maybe um, uh, even um, they have links to the communities. Uh, maybe maybe they, they, they already bring in some networks uh, from, from uh, maybe previous backgrounds. Uh, and, 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 and I know network building takes time and you need a long-term strategy. That means uh, this, is, this is key. Uh, before we think about uh, the next step you 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 already raised I, I i think we are not yet there yeah so uh, do we think that um uh, one of the characteristics of um having a, a network of ospos is that it essentially is leading by example it's going to make um organizations um public sector organizations foundations companies um easier for them to establish um uh, similar bodies internally within their own management structures Yeah. Kenneth, I don't know if you wanted to, to respond to that. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, right, fantastic. I think, unfortunately, we seem to have lost Yuto, which is, um, is, is, is very unfortunate. Um, and um, we are um, sort of reaching the, the end of, um, of our allotted time as well. So um, I would very much like to uh, thank the panel members um, for their uh, excellent responses and uh, fascinating discussion. Um, I'm going to go round and um, ask one final question for each of them. Sivan, do we have time to do that? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I went in a bit early there. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no problem at all. No problem at all. Um, so, um, if anyone would, has got um, any closing uh, remarks that they would um, like to make based on the discussion that we've had so far, so um, if I could uh, um, uh, start with Reagan, please. I guess in terms of closing, I would I would highlight what I said in the opening, which which relates to this discussion about the strategy uh, and in the ideal world. Um, any kind of strategy that is intending to bring, you know, to scale open source and to keep it, you know, to keep these projects going uh, and to really increase the adoption is really important to think about um, a comprehensive strategy and not just the code itself, but to really consider open practices. And what does that actually mean? Working in the open, thinking about, you know, having a clear, we, you know, we have the manifesto, but you could have, you know, different sort of principles to help guide that ecosystem, engaging community, finding ways to, to get, um, you know, contributors and document all of their work. So there's a lot of peripheral um, work, I think, that is often overlooked. And in any strategy, and the commission is really considering how to do this, I think, considering those elements, um, and what has been mentioned as well around the AI positioning and all of those things would be really, really beneficial to help um, really, I think, ramp up the, the uptake uh, of open source in, in Europe. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Knut, um, final thoughts from you? Yeah, and the, uh, what what I'd like to see is is really that 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 open source is really embedded in in different uh, strategies uh, at the European level, at the national level, but maybe also at the regional. Level. Uh, Regan, you mentioned AI, uh, but if I look at the the recently published papers by the Commission on AI, 
uh, open source again uh, is is either not mentioned at all, yeah, or or really to a very limited degree. I mean, it's not really exploiting the potential which is there, also to to make the difference and push push uh, AI towards uh, an AI we, we also want. Yeah, that means. Uh, mm -hmm open, transparent, and also uh, for the people, and maybe also for, for getting uh, the, the sustainable development goals reached. Excellent, thank you. Pierre, any closing remarks? Okay, many thanks. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, I think on the on the public administration side, we're we're very much on track. So um, uh, at European level, but also uh, we see increasingly member states taking this up as part of their um, uh, digital public sector modernization strategy. Um, uh, well, we we focus on the on the um, uh, industrial strategy, but what you have to realize is that Europe is injecting at the moment huge amount of money at national level uh, through the resilience. Mm -hmm. and recovery uh, facility and that's something we actually scrutinize whenever member states are putting forward project proposal for uh, digitization of the of the public sector so we're quite attentive on the on the sort of solution that they uh, that they want to deploy looking if they can uh, indeed reuse um, uh, or use open source uh, solution in that uh, in that respect um, just a remark on the on the private side because it's not only um, it should not only be led from the uh, from the public uh, side um, you know, it, it takes a few large companies to uh, to show the example and create momentum. Uh, you know, a couple of visible CIOs saying uh, we're moving our enter entire enterprise uh, to open source solution. That makes a huge uh, difference. So we we also need to work on uh, on this side. Um, uh, there can be courageous uh, CIOs, innovative companies that can uh, actually make the switch or make switch that they have made already uh, just more visible. Uh, which is mm -hmm. also um, part of the of the equation. Yeah. So we're very much uh, looking forward uh, using the, the the recommendation of the of the study. Uh, many thanks to Fraunhofer and OFE for uh, doing this work for for us, uh, and looking forward to pursuing the, the the engagement with the with the community. Many thanks. Yeah, thank you, Pierre. Um, so unfortunately, I think that um, Yuta has still dropped out. So um, I would like to take. Oh, Yuta, are you there? No, it's not. It's, I'm sorry, no, I'm not okay. your time. No, it's just, a, it's just <laughs> also a German, but not your time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Um, so thank you once more to the panelists. Um, really uh, appreciate um, your sort of insight um, and input to that. Um, that was very very interesting. Much appreciated, Sivan. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, thank you also from, from our side, from the OFE side, of everybody uh, participating and especially, of course, speaking to, to uh, Pierre, Regen, Knut and Jutta, who probably can't hear us now. And last but not least, uh, Andrew, you. Um, I think we're really so happy to finally start sharing more and more from the study and that will continue. At some point, I'm sure we'll also talk about the policy analysis, which I'm personally very excited about. Um, and um, yeah, also to say that I think from the from the discussion, I think everybody I'm sure took away a lot from that um, the the criticalness I guess of open source when it comes to digit digitization, open source as more than just code, uh, many other aspects, um, and we'll get more opportunities to speak. Um, last th thing to say is that we'll have more events of the policy series that we'll announce very shortly with very exciting topics. So stay tuned and have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, Simon. Mm -hmm.